Thank you to the organisers for inviting me to be here. This is the first time in over a quarter of a century that I've spoken on Bath Sugars in England. The uh, last time was when we released the Comas Sugar Panel uh, outcome in 1988, I think, and it's interesting to hear that that terminology, which Martin Wiseman was largely responsible for, is only just on the way out, Martin. So it had a long, um, it had a long life. I guess. <laughs> right. So um, what I'm going to do today is to take you on a very rapid uh, history lesson um, regarding this 60-year saga of sugar and human health, which uh, really started, um, I suppose, in 1954 with the publication of this Viperholm study uh, linking uh, the eating of sticky toffee apples with dental caries. And I'm not going to say any more about dental caries because Paula is going to talk about that later on. But um, I will just stop for a moment at um, uh, Pure White and Deadly, which of course most of you will be aware of. The book has been republished, which I think appeared in the 1964, I think was the first edition, where John Yudkin claimed that sugar was related to obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and, and a number of other things, but principally uh, that particular collection uh, of problems. Now, the uh, late 1960s, early 70s, and indeed 80s, um, was really a period in which confusion reigned supreme. And I'm just going to st uh, stop very briefly to kind of summarize um, in one slide what took place in, the, um, in, in those years. And I really apologize for, for quoting some of my own stuff there, but it's actually quite hard to find uh, some of that older literature, but you will simply have to take my word for it that what we showed uh, was actually uh, duplicated by many other groups of researchers at the time, and if I'm wrong, please stand up and say so. But basically, uh, John Yudkin's epidemiological studies were largely flawed. They were based on international comparisons with selected populations. The dietary intervention studies almost all involved very high intakes of sugars, sucrose in particular, with no attempt to look at the confounding uh, by changes in weight. And so when we first started publishing in this area, I think three things emerged, uh, as I say, um, from, from ourselves and, and by a number of other groups, mostly in, in, in Britain and some in the United States at the time. The first thing which I think is particularly interesting is that it did seem that when you gave free living individuals advice to restrict their sugar, even if they were asked to increase other dietary constituents, particularly uh, starchy carbohydrates at the time, they lost weight and reduced triglyceride levels. Uh, and I mean, interesting, we'll return to that theme uh, shortly. Uh, sugar restriction with no weight loss was only at that stage uh, appeared to be hypertriglyceridemic when it was consumed in very large amounts and when dietary fat was predominantly saturated, interestingly enough, and several groups uh, demonstrated that. And there were several papers, though, which suggested that there was a very small number of people in the population who were, in fact, sucrose-sensitive, mainly by virtue of becoming hypertriglyceridemic with substantial intakes of sugar. So uh, then there was some interest in uh, sugar and diabetes, and a number of us uh, in, in Britain at the time, Mike Lean, who was then um, uh, uh, back in, in, in Scotland, uh, and ourselves, looked at sucrose in the diet of diabetic patients, and we showed that really, when uh, you took sugar, uh, sugar, and when I say sugar, I'm referring here to sucrose, in and out of the diabetic diet, it really made very little difference to uh, glycemic control. And in fact, very little difference to uh, plasma lipid levels as they were measured at the time, obviously uh, very basic measurements of lipids. To the extent that I um, wrote in 19... for diabetic medicine, of which I, I was then uh, associate editor, but we didn't have anything for one of the issues, and uh, so I quickly was asked to write something, and I wrote about simple sugars and diabetes, and concluded that uh, really as far as the etiology of what was then called non-insulin dependent diabetes, there really was no evidence that uh, any mono or disaccharides uh, or other carbohydrate containing foods contributed to the etiology of, of type 2 diabetes and indeed uh, went so far as to say that uh, it seemed likely that uh, allowing a bit of... Uh, I'm 
particularly with Phil James sitting in the front row, um, that uh, for many diabetic patients, um, actually permitting a modest amount of sucrose might actually be quite a good idea. So that was where we were at in, in 1987. And um, that was at the time that even in Britain, there was acceptance that cholesterol might have something to do with uh, cardiovascular disease and that this might indeed be related to saturated fat. So that what came from McDonald's was a big no-no, uh, but sugar was probably all right. And um, so uh, there was a proliferation of products that looked rather like this. Um, a very delicious 97% fat-free apricot bar, um, which contained about 30 grams of sugar, um, of total sugars. Uh, much of it was, was, was probably sucrose. Um, and uh, this uh, really became um, increasingly, um, increasingly prevalent. So not a lot happened on the sugars front, I think, particularly until um, uh, uh, the late 1990s, sort of sugar went out of the news somewhat, but was uh, considered in this report which appeared um, in, the, in 1997, Carbohydrates and Human Nutrition, and there are a couple of us here today who were involved in this report, and this report, having looked at the data, um, and I should just remind you that all recommendations at this stage were based on expert opinion. There was no such thing as meta-analyses and uh, systematic literature reviews. They were reviews of the literature, but uh, certainly not systematic the way we understand this now. And the consultation uh, recommended that excess energy intake in any form will cause body fat accumulation, so that while excess consumption of low-fat foods, while not as obesity-producing as excess consumption of high-fat products, will lead to obesity if energy expenditure is not increased. Uh, there was a further statement about compromising micronutrient density, but another reassuring statement in relation uh, to uh, other chronic diseases. Now, um, some of you in this room will be aware that uh, there was a certain degree of uh, subversion involved uh, in the final writing of this report, which was demonstrated in the Panorama program uh, uh, in the early, early part of this century, uh, 2004. And um, so the report was largely discredited, which, which in some ways is unfortunate because there was quite useful discussion behind the report, but perhaps um, uh, not quite uh, reflected uh, in, in, in final recommendations. So uh, come 2003, I think, uh, the infamous TR916 appeared, and this was really the time that there was uh, a firm recommendation regarding uh, the actual quantity of free sugars which was regarded as appropriate, and the 10% figure emerged from WHO. Again, this report, and there are several people in this room who were involved in this report, um, uh, uh, was, I think, uh, not a systematic review to the extent that we talk about systematic reviews today, but it was a very careful examination of the literature at the time. Uh, but you will remember, many of you, that that was controversial too, and uh, there was an attempt to actually uh, rubbish this report at the highest possible level, um, uh, particularly from uh, the global sugar industry, but, but also from, from the US government to some extent, and there was a threat to uh, the actual funding of WHO as a result of this report. Um, and to its credit, WHO did try uh, to, uh, to, to stand by the recommendations of its, uh, its expert group at the time. But there was, further, there was further confusion, because as you may have picked up in that last slide that I showed very briefly, and I did say that I was going to rush through this historical tour, um, the, um, the industry and the United States government actually pointed out that there was very conflicting advice uh, from a very authoritative body in the United States at the time, the Institute of Medicine, which had said that no added sugars, uh, that added sugars should not in, uh, exceed 25% uh, of total calories. Well, um, for anybody who actually read the Institute of Medicine's report, this was not surprising particularly because it had nothing to do with the role of sugars in obesity or other chronic diseases. It simply related 
to uh, nutritional adequacy and indicated that in the context of a very affluent society, that is the United States of America, it was conceivable that you could get enough nutrients uh, if you had as much as 25% of total calories coming from sugar. It had absolutely nothing to do with whether sugar in some form, shape or size might be detrimental to human health. So we all held our breath for a number of years uh, because EFSA, um, waiting for EFSA was almost like waiting for SACA has been announced. Um, we were waiting with bated breath to see what EFSA would come out with. And frankly, EFSA wasn't uh, terribly helpful when the report emerged in 2010. Um, it said that cons frequent consumption of sugar can increase the risk of dental caries, but was very, very lukewarm about the role of sugar sweetened beverages and weight gain. And an extraordinary statement. Um, about uh, that if you have more than 20% of uh, total energy coming from sugar, it might increase cholesterol and triglyceride uh, and might adversely affect glucose and insulin response. Uh, I don't know whether there are any people in this room today who were involved in the EFSA report, but uh, a comment that was made by one of my colleagues at the time was that if the EFSA report was the literature review of a PhD thesis, the thesis would fail outright. It was really rather like an old-fashioned sort of literature review, um, and I can provide the name of the person who said it if that's required. Um, but, um, uh, but, but it really was a very inadequate literature review. So that um, WHO really felt that um, they needed to uh, take a more formal approach to evaluate the literature and see what the literature really said in terms of sugar and uh, chronic disease, and set up uh, a group called the Nutrition Guidance um, Advisory Group, a rather presumptuous title actually, um, uh, uh, that was going to kind of uh, look at this in a totally dispassionate way, and uh, uh, there are three people in this room today who are members of that group, uh, but we were charged with uh, trying to uh, do pretty much what second uh, uh, set up to do, um, but specifically, in this instance, with regard to, to, to sugars, the, the group has a, a, a much wider brief, um, uh, but, but sugars was the business of today. There's already been some discussion about definition of sugars, and um, WHO for some time has preferred that term free sugars, but as Alison has said, uh, the terminology, um, really there's not that much difference at the end of the day. Um, in, in total amounts if you talk about added sugars or free sugars or, or non-milk extrinsic sugars. So WHO has made a decision that grade will be used for all recommendations uh, from WHO and of course this creates a lot of difficulties for those of us in nutrition because grade was never invented for the purpose of making nutritional recommendations and uh, to be perfectly honest uh, it has proved to be something of a nightmare for any group around the world. I've been involved with a number of uh, nutritional recommendations in a number of different countries, and everybody is finding the same difficulty. So I think it is a huge challenge uh, to try and see how we can use this, uh, this monster, uh, which is GRADE, uh, to try and make nutritional recommendations. But whether we like it or not, GRADE is going to be with us for a time to come, so we have to try and use it. And I think at the end of the day, um, we have uh, had some experience at WHO with using it now, and, and uh, the Nordic folks and, and other people have, have, uh, have actually uh, discovered that it can be used with difficulty, provided at the end of the day, and this is incredibly important, common sense can prevail in actually making the recommendations and one can utilize the concept of totality of evidence in actually coming up with your final recommendation. There are a number of people who are uh, in the process of writing uh, uh, about how one should actually use GRADE uh, for nutritional recommendations and I think this will come into the literature uh, very soon. But basically, of course, as most of you will be aware, GRADE hinges on a proper systematic review of the literature uh, and, if humanly possible, a series of meta-analyses, preferably of randomized controlled trials if they exist, uh, 
but if randomized controlled trials don't exist, cohort studies, but at the back of one's mind always taking um, uh, uh, taking cognizance of the fact that there is a whole body of physiology and biochemistry that must, must be taken into account. Uh, this is simply uh, reminding us that uh, in terms of quality of the evidence, if we're using GRADE, that if we don't have randomized controlled trials, we are in great difficulty, and those of you who have had any experience with making recommendations um, uh, about diet and cancer will be, of course, very aware of this uh, problem. Uh, we don't always have randomized controlled trials, and when we have to rely on cohort studies, there are some difficulties because randomized controlled trials can be downgraded, but uh, to take a cohort study has got to be upgraded, and that's not an easy, uh, not an easy thing to do. So interestingly, although the process of SACM and WHO were completely independent, and we certainly didn't know what was going on with SACN, and SACN I don't think knew what we were up to, uh, also decided, and this I think is important, that we uh, were going to concentrate on sugars in relation to body fatness and sugars in relation to dental caries. That is not implying that we didn't think there were other important effects of dietary sugars, but we felt that if we were going to make recommendations, these were the two areas uh, in which we should, uh, on which we should uh, uh, put, put most of our uh, efforts. And I have no idea what those little yellow things are that keep on coming up there. Something to do with uh, uh, Max and PC incompatibility. But, um, uh, and I'm afraid there's a little bit of duplication here with some of the uh, slides that Alison showed, but basically we looked at uh, reduced versus usual sugars in adults in terms of body weight. And as you can see there, they're actually some of the same uh, slide, the same studies. I suspect we had slightly different criteria from those used by SACN. But very interesting, although we had somewhat different studies, came up with absolutely identical con conclusions. You may not think that there's much in uh, less than a kilogram, but the studies were of short duration. And of particular interest, when looking at increased versus usual sugars intake in adults, there was a virtually identical weight gain to the weight loss that occurred around about a kilogram. But of great importance, I think, is that when looking at the longer term studies, uh, there is actually a very much greater weight gain. And in fact, when you come to think of it, that we too used six weeks for some of those randomized controlled trials as a cutoff, uh, it was pretty remarkable that within six weeks, with, uh, in which people who were free living were permitted to increase their sugar intake, we were seeing a weight gain uh, of a kilogram. But I think what was also of great relevance, and I'll expand on this in a moment, is that when we looked at those studies where higher and lower sugars were compared, mostly in free living situations, but when people were really encouraged, uh, encouraged very strongly uh, that they should replace their sugar, that the replacement should be isocaloric with other starches, there was actually no evidence of weight change. So, suggesting that at least in the context of free living individuals, it was really a phenomenon to which I think Alison referred, and that is that when people were given free reign about the amount of sugars that they ate or didn't eat, they were likely to increase or decrease their calories uh, one way or the other. Um, sugar sweetened beverages in children, well, um, you've, you've already heard about this, so I won't uh, linger on that. Now, GRADE is this interesting process, and there isn't time to give you a lecture on how one goes about GRADE, but when you've done your grading of these different studies, uh, there are wonderful computer programs, which I don't understand how they work, but you feed all your data into these computer programs, and you get these wonderful uh, tables that come out, which give you a summary of the effect um, uh, size over there, and it tells you about whether the quality of the data are good, and it tells you about the importance, and then it is up to uh, the, um, this expert committee to, to come up with recommendations. <coughs> I'm not going to talk about uh, dental caries because, as I said earlier, Paula is going to discuss dental caries. But quite uh, remarkably, we came out with um, not dissimilar uh, recommendations on the basis of what Paula will show you about dental caries uh, and of what I have spoken in relation to body fatness. Uh, was remarkably similar, uh, some remarkably similar recommendations, again bearing in mind that these are draft ones too, but I do want to stress, and Paula will probably uh, return to this, that when we came up with rather lower recommendations,
recommendations than that magical 10% figure which we endorsed. Um, uh, uh, it was largely based not so much on energy intake, which is what Saturn did, but it was based on data relating to dental caddies. So I won't say any more than that uh, at the moment because I think the time to discuss that is probably after Paula has spoken. Now, I did mention that uh, our specific brief was to look at um, uh, body fatness and dental caries. But it is interesting just to look at some of the other data, and I know uh, Robert Lustig is going to be, well, I assume Robert Lustig is going to talk about this in some detail. But it is reassuring that when one looks at hard clinical endpoints, and I emphasize fairly hard clinical endpoints, because virtually all the, uh, the official means of making recommendations, most especially grade, uh, tend to be based on clinical endpoints rather than some measurement in the laboratory, rather than cholesterol or whatever or some lipid measurement, but it is reassuring that if one looks at, for instance, sugar-sweet beverages and type 2 diabetes, a consistent picture emerges. Um, when one looks at sugar intake and cardiovascular disease mortality, and I'm just going to flick through these because my time is nearly up, um, that there is uh, remarkably uh, consistent evidence from the N. Haynes data, which looks as if around about 10% of calories from added sugar, that uh, increased risk of mortality from cardiovascular disease starts to increase. And we have just published in, in the June issue of the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition uh, some further meta-analyses meta looking at the large number of studies, much larger number of studies than Saturn did because we had much broader entry criteria, at the effect of sugars on triglyceride. Um, not sophisticated lipid measurements, because most of the studies didn't have sophisticated lipid measurements. Uh, a very tiny but significant effect on triglycerides, regardless of whether the replacement was isocaloric top panel or whether the replacement was ad libitum. Um, and uh, similarly for cholesterol, although the ad libitum, ad libitum replacement was not statistically significant, but overall a significant effect on cholesterol. And also, a small uh, but significant effect on uh, blood pressure when considering longer term studies. So, um, I'm told by the chair we've got three minutes and I have about two and a half, so I, I think that will be here. Yeah. So, um, what I really uh, am trying to do is to say that while the very strict criteria required hard clinical endpoints such as those I've mentioned, um, it is reassuring that when one looks at some additional data, they are very compatible with uh, what has been uh, recommended. Um, so the, second, um, uh, the, 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 the second recommendations have already been covered. So uh, really just to end up with, I mean, I think we really are on very strong ground now for making strong recommendations about the reduction of uh, uh, dietary free sugars. Uh, I think the 10% figure is beyond, arg beyond argument. I think the question really arises as to how low should one go, and I think it certainly is lower than 10%, but I'm not quite sure really where it will be, and I think the discussion that will take place in response to the draft second recommendations and the draft WHO recommendations will really be extremely interesting. That is 50 grams of sugar, not in a jug, but in a, in a cup, um, and it's not a lot. Thank you.